say? Right? No. No. Oh, oh man. We use television. Okay. And we close this door if you want to, but if you get too hot, you might want to back open. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. We don't have the air on. And yeah, yeah. yeah. We, or air on. We're fine, and uh, it will get hot. It can get hot in here, and we'll crack the door. Close it then. Yeah, close the door then. Yeah, close the door then. And, uh, All right, that'd be fine. Really good, though. The tenant's there. He's fine. And there's another one. My name is Gary Hilton. Yeah, yeah, and I'm Gary Smith. I'm a captain with the sheriff's office in Pickens, South Carolina. You're a captain? Yes, sir, and, I am. And you're Gary? Dewey. Oh, Dewey. Dewey. At the Angry House, I'm the chief of police and Thomas to Georgia. Hey, great, man. Dewey is that. Well, they, I, I didn't think y'all looked like uh, attorneys. No, no, we're not attorneys. I thought this pizza is just too tough, man. You know, attorneys are a bunch of crooks. He's half of them are homosexual today. I did. I thought these guys. You got a lot on you that you could, that you could be in Hollywood. How do you? I mean, you know, as the shirt. As the nigga sitting in the money. They, they make you wear a pair of cowboys. Uh, well, you know. <laughs> hey, that's what you will love you. Hey, what did you get? Uh, Say, so what, what's that guy, Gary, Mike, or Mr.? <laughs> my name is Gary. Yeah. Uh, my trade name in the siding business is Mac the Siding Guy. You might have heard that. That's a nom de sales, a sales name. Because that called Gary doesn't sound like your typical sign, you know. You know. But uh, it's Gary. Not good. Gary's just too lousy fartsy though for you know a crap like sign. Hey, you know what the idiot is? Uh, it's uh, yeah. What you got? Uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's, I got someone talk to you, man. Uh, today is uh, Friday. Isn't it? No. I, yeah, I mean, you know. The 17th. The 17th of Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Thursday. It's not because I'm, uh, it's just because the days fly by and, and no one messes with me here. They treat me real good. Probably the last 2 p.m. Uh, it is. It is. That's right at 2. Oh, okay. I'm, if I know how to use this recorder, I'm recording, okay? I assume so, any, and when I'm talking to the police, I assume that. Yeah, and I assume he's picking up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what I'm interested in is uh, some of your travels 10 years ago. Uh, uh, let me tell you what I've got, or I'm not going to tell you anything I've got. I'll tell you why I'm here and what I'm going to know. Uh, I have a uh, family, that's, they're out of Pennsylvania, uh, and they're grieving and have been grieving for the last 10 years over a uh, child of theirs that was a university student that went missing. Where did he go missing? Was, are you familiar with Clemson, South Carolina? No, but... What are you familiar with in uh, South Carolina? Let me ask you that. Nothing. It's, uh, all I've done is transited South Carolina on the way to North Carolina. And I've been to North Carolina, of course, since I'm an outdoor full bore hiking stud, uh, yeah. you know, over 20 years I've been I've been to North Carolina. Yeah. Well, North Carolina and South Carolina, you know, we border in the area of Oconee County. Yeah. Where Clayton, Georgia is. Yeah. All right. Well, if you come right into Clayton, Georgia, on uh, 76, okay. you'll be in the. Where did, where uh, did he go missing? The Table Rock. Rock. Okay. Table uh, Rock State Park. Okay. I've heard about that. I've heard about that case. And it certainly does, at uh, first glance, just on the surface similarities fit my ammo. Okay, but I'm gonna have to weaken the door. I'll, I'll be glad to talk to you all you want. I get bored sitting up there, but yeah. about that thing. But I'm gonna tell you right now what I said to Florida. Yes. Put this on the grill. I am. It's, it's a dude. Yeah, I, you know, because put it right here. Because uh, I would love nothing else uh, but to clear up not only that I have been involved for the family. So, of course, I'm more than happy to clear up things that I wasn't involved in also. I've already offered Florida full and complete cooperation in, in the manner that I gave the Georgia GBI. And I'm sure you've seen my debriefing tapes. You have heard and seen it. You've seen the two auto long one, which was my initial narrative of the crime itself. And I'm sure you've seen the videotape uh, of the debriefing done in the Dawson County Jail 
post-sentencing, the two agents that had worked that case uh, came to see me. I'd already been sentenced for this. They brought me two cups of coffee, and I talked them. I gave them four hours. I talked them out of there. Finally, they finally said, oh, yeah, it's 6 o'clock. You're going to miss dinner. we got to go, you know. And uh, so the point I'm trying to make is that anyone viewing and listening to those tapes would immediately recognize that I gave them every detail in just a candid, straightforward way. I had remorse for what I've done, but once you get past the initial embarrassment uh, of talking about it, which was only, was only right at first, it just became a professional recitation. The newspaper and the news media said that I was chillingly calm. Uh, they called it, uh, a TV commentator called it the banality of evil. Vernon Keenan, the director of the GBI, stood on TV. I saw him on Channel 5, said, this man is a despicable human being. And amazingly enough, none of them recognized what I was doing. And that is, I was speaking in the language and affect or manner of a police officer. Of a police officer giving a report of an incident to his superiors. In other words, I was talking like a cop to a cop. And I told them every detail in the world. As, as you saw, I was very frank. I told them they built out their lives. I produced an ice, lost control of it, produced a baton, lost control of it. You know, I told them every detail in the world that I didn't even have to tell them. The point of the story is that I offered them to do. Florida came up to see me, uh, two detectives, Leon County, and I offered them the same kind of cooperation and anything that I could give to them uh, for a, uh, an immunity deal. And, and I didn't offer life because I've got life. And uh, I didn't offer a plea, I thought maybe strategically, uh, tactically, you know. Uh, so the only higher sentence I could get is death anyway. So, uh, and I offered that. If they would just simply leave me alone and, and let me do life. And I've offered that in Florida already. So, anyway, to wrap this story up, since I'm, I would be happy with the, with the deal to, to clear up anything that I might have clear up, uh, I will also be glad to clear up anything that I can't clear up. And that is, I'm going to tell you, and I've told everyone this, I told the board of this too, that when they were up here, I said, I'll give you something for free right now. And you're right. I said, nothing before September of last year. Actually, I think in October of last year. Nothing before, but I give my word, nothing before September of last year. Gentlemen, this is the truth. You know, you, you can not, I you can believe it or not, but this is the truth. Nothing, my activity started in September of last year. There is nothing before September of last year. Let me finish up. Yeah. In 95, I pled to two felonies and pulled two concurrent five-year probations. I con concurrent. I violated no laws from 95 until my activity, my rampage started. None, with the ex exception of marijuana usage, failure to file, te file taxes, and a park after dark citation. I didn't even violate traffic laws. I, I got no traffic ticket. That's the truth. And I'll tell you as many times as you want to convince you. For the families. I mean, uh, I could, for the families that are hurt because of me and for the families that are hurt because of being something else. Uh, if this is one more load or possibility off their back, I'm going to tell you right now, they can rest easy. I violated no laws from 95 through September of last year. Nothing. Not even I didn't get a traffic ticket. That's the story. Let me, <coughs> let me, I wasn't going to interrupt you. Yeah. Let, me, let me just tell you, you know how police officers work, and you know what that means to so. What is that, a waiver? Yeah, I, I can't sign any waiver. Okay, well, you, you, I'm not going to... Oh, I understand. I understand my rights. I understand that I have the right to yeah, uh, remain solid, that uh, I could have an attorney here. I, Actually, my court attorneys have put a notice uh, in my file that I'm not to see any police officer.
ounces or anything else. But on the other hand, uh, the GBI, okay, the GBI made a deal, or not the GBI, but the Florida, uh, Georgia authorities made a deal with me, that penalty off the table, give us our body. And I, re I appreciated that, especially since Dawson County did want to kill me big, big time. They really wanted to just disregard that agreement. They ended up sticking by, and I, I thought, well, plus I like my GBI handler, Federal too, Cliff Bridges and another younger guy. Bernie Gina and I, I, I had a GBI John Cable, though. Cable said that I was absolutely evil, and I was really disappointed. This kind of emotionalism. Uh, and inflammatory statements has no business being in the lexicon of a professional police officer. A police officer, especially an experienced one like these two gentlemen, should know the duality of human nature and they should know that evil lurks in everybody's heart. There's no one that's all good and there's maybe no one that's all bad. There may be some exceptions in that, but certainly not with me. And for them to make such flagrantly broad emotional. Cable admitted over a senior GBI John, That man's about to retire, John Cable. He's about to retire from GBI. He's going to be head of Dawson uh, Investigative Unit, okay? And for a police officer with, with a full career behind him, to, and he admitted it, became emotionally involved and it becomes that, that emotional. It's unforgivable, and I'll tell you why. Because in my opinion, Emotional involvement is the number one reason that police officers end their career prematurely. They get about five years into it, and they start realizing that everybody's got an asshole, and it just tears them up. Or, you know, everybody's got an asshole, all you got to do is look for it. They see the bad, the bad, the bad, the bad. They get torn up, they end their career. So that's why. Any uniformed officer could have told those gentlemen that to that degree, degree of emotional involvement is, 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 a, is a professional mistake. Anyway, I'm just fine. Well, I've got, got quite a few years. You, you and I are probably the same age. I'm 59 I'm, years old. I'm 61. I've got a couple of them. You're a military man, too, right? Yeah, yeah. Everyone here. Yeah, yeah. 60s. I did go to men, but did you go to men? Yeah, I did. Well, I'm a military police in Vietnam. Oh, okay. In Vietnam. Yeah. Well, let me see if I can take you back. I think I know as much about your record as you because I've been studying it yeah. since this came about. I don't want to tell you why. But in the 1998, do you remember where you were in 1998? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try it somewhere around Easter time in 1998. Okay, hey, look, I, it, I, I just, the, the newspaper has done such a happy job. I'm constantly referred to as a director, okay? Anyone that did the smallest amount of checking, like looking at my DMV records, would see that I lived in the same residence for nine years, and I worked for the same employer for 10 years. I worked for John Taylor and Slade Wall System from 97 to 07. I lived on this property from 98. To You're telling me the truth, but I've already checked. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and they never fail to call me a drifter. And instead of saying I'm 10, they say I'm scrabbling. They cut me. They say I, in my, in my uh, confession, you know, they had that release from the TV. Spin, and they say, uh, in spite of myself, I admitted that the girl almost got the best of me. I didn't do anything in spite of myself. I, you know, I told them. It's just like a cop. He knew he got his ass whipped, and then he'd tell his sergeant, hey, you know, this not every fight goes right. <laughs> you can't let him off. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Well, okay, I'm going to tell you, this young man, he, he, he went missing. He was a military oh, yeah, Easter of 98. Yeah. He, okay. He was a military guy, too. Oh, this is a small, this was a, a break in employment from John Tabor. That's right. That's right. I had, I had uh, two breaks in employment. Uh, one was... One was early 98, and the other was uh, 2007. Each time for first time was about four months. I got this, and John Tigger got this, so I was way out of the paper bag, so I get this. Plus, I found a steamer. And also in, in 2000, and uh, this is going to sound like, you know, a typical non-alibi, but in April, I can place my, my whereabouts because of that big tornado that came through Dunwoody. Georgia in Atlanta in uh, about April the 12th. Uh, I don't know what April would have been. But the point is, I was homeless. Uh, I've been living in the, the
sure about its storage. Uh, and I got thrown out of there for the second and final time. When I, yeah, I got thrown out of there. No, that wasn't the final time. Yeah, it was. I, I've been thrown out of there for the final time. No, but she's not supposed to live in storage. I got, I got, I got away with it from 1990, early 90 to late 97. I lived, I lived in a storage unit. Now, when you were thrown out, did you go camping then? Or what? No, I was employed. And I'll tell you where uh, I was employed. Uh, unfortunately, again, the company is it's, it's America's Home Remodelers. And it was at uh, Windy Hill. What does it mean? American Home Remodelers? America has, well, uh, America's Home Remodelers. It was in the office park. Uh, Where they look at? They, they no longer are. Like, like many companies in the siding business, the whole yeah. environment is. It was down there, yeah. No, but the supervisor was a woman that's well known in the, uh, the business. Her name was uh, J.C. Hudson. J.C.? Yeah, and I don't know if it's initials or what, but it's. Uh, okay. Yeah, she does. And she was, she's well known in the siding business. She's still around. She's still around Georgia area. I, I haven't heard of her sit in ten years. Okay. At any rate, so I didn't have my storage unit to live in. I would keep a ten by thirty unit, and it would virtually be a living room in there. Right. And I just went through a series of managers and even a change of ownership, and got away with it. It's, I almost started to write a book like Alex Haley. Haley wrote Airport and Hotel. Well, I was going to write one called Storage. <laughs> it was weird. We had a little salt culture there. <laughs> so I was. Well, let's say you were homeless and living in that storage unit at the time. I assume you were going to keep a vehicle. Yeah, 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 sure. And, I, and, and the, all the vehicles, the GBI, uh, on that four hour briefing, debriefing in uh, Dawson County. Right on top of the head. You yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, because I only, I only owned about three cars in my life, okay, and that was the, the black uh, uh, 1989 Mazda B2200 pickup truck, black with uh, maroon gray pinstripe and a uh, gray uh, camera shell top. Uh, it was a Lear brand, L-E-E-R, Lear Macho brand uh, model. Uh, gray fiberglass camera shop. It was more or less uh, in, along the roof line. It wasn't built up. You got a very good memory. I don't. I haven't had that many vehicles, and I drove that proper or that that truck for 200,000 miles. I I got it to seven miles, and I broke 200,000. I know that from uh, June of '89, and I drove that. I drove that until September of 2000. You got it in 89? June of 89. I got it new at Jim Ellis Monster. Carl Parkway. Bought it new. You got a lot of service out of it. Oh, yeah. I would have gotten more if I would have gotten a lot of repairs done on it. Uh, let, uh, 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 let me tell you again, I'm here on behalf of the family. I also I want you to show that family that I'm I'm sorry on the one hand, but I'm happy on the other. I'm happy that I can clear up one avenue. I'm sorry that I'm sorry that that I can't. Uh, well, you know everybody wants closure. I understand that. I understand. What I want to show you now, if you don't mind, I'll look at it. If you'll, this is a picture of the uh, young piece of punch. Yeah. That's a picture. Yeah, I've seen this type of face a million times with the smuggles. I, I, I don't want you to oh, 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 put anything in your mind. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Uh, this is almost a generic young yuppie face. We're living in a virtual la la world. We don't know. I quit so much of the so much ass on these guys over dogs. Man. I, I ran, I ran male dogs for 20 years, and it always went down like the loose male dog. Yo, I'm afraid of your dog. Don't let it confront me. Oh, it's okay. He's friendly. I said, hey, I don't want to meet your dog. Keep 
come away from me. Hey, what do you mean? You got a bad attitude. I said, hey, I'm going to tell you that dog come over here. I'm going to whip his head. And the next thing you know, they're always bigger than me. They're always going to be bigger than you. I have, a, I have one of these guys come up like that. And the next thing you know, he'd be running for his life. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to slam the guy. I don't know. I don't know. I want to ask you a question. Now, anything you think might have you on any other case, don't answer.
two cents. I don't know. Okay. Yes. One cent. I, I know that, yeah, 78, 76, something like that. So you, you can't miss it. This one goes through, uh, so north, it, it, it's Brevard. Yes. It's full. It's two cents. Okay. Yeah. It's I don't know what you're talking about. Now. Yeah. I would, I would use this route if I spell like it. There's an almost an infinite number of routes if you're not in a hurry. And I would use this route to go to that intersection in Brevard, basically, oh. and to go to the hiking trail. Yeah, what did, what did you say? What did you call it again? Whiteside Mountain. Whiteside Mountain. That's what I'm saying it is. And I'm saying that's, the, that's the, actually the other to the river. Well, I'm gonna, but that might place it in North Carolina. I don't know. Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. I call that a blue time. I'm going to go ahead and tell you where this is at. Yeah. And maybe see if that will this is a table rock. Table rock? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there's, there's the table rock I know is uh, Linville Gorge. No. No. Table. You know, you know Linville Gorge in North Carolina, they have all these Hawkbill Mountain, Table Rock, Table Rock Mountain, and I gotta tell you, there's probably a dozen Table Rock Mountains. Well, let me ask you this. Did you ever frequent the state parks or the local parks? No, uh, local I do because uh, I've been in local parks all over because of the dog, you see. I've always run dogs. Did you go? But state parks I don't go because there's a fee almost in every month. Did you go in where you had to pay the No, no, that's why uh, I don't go into state parks because uh, I don't, 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 don't pay the fee. All right, if you put your glasses on, let me. Sure. Let me grab me my pen and you'll have a pen and I'll have a pen. Okay. I'm not going to write on it, but I'll use it. Yeah, well, let's put it right here. Right here. No, I will Well, so I can point out. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try it and I didn't bring the glasses in. Yeah. I'm going to do the best I can. I probably had 
Let me preface this by saying the quick in Georgia, the quickest way to meet a law enforcement officer is to enter uh, WMM. <laughs> it is. It is. They'll be they'll be field interrogating you within six year uh, six days. I don't care where you're camp. And I have been field interrogated. Let me put it this way: you, you saw a, a, a videotape of Cherokee County Sheriff's Departments doing a field interrogation on me. I've been field interrogated two times in 24 hours, just in, in 12 hours. Okay. I was stopped because I broke, I was stopped the night before because I broke the solid yellow line. I was messing with the dog and the DU, they thought they had a DUI in their hand. And they stopped me and, and let me go when they saw I wasn't drunk. And then at nine in the next morning, Cherokee County Sheriff's Department was there field interrogating. So that was two within 12 hours. Yeah, I understand that. And when you're in, in WMAs, that's the quickest way to meet a law enforcement officer. So right. that's when I don't remember it. Well, I, just, okay, I think this was uh, probably at the river line there at the river. Man, let's go that's that's two years ago. Yeah, let's, okay. If you tell me the circumstances, I might just... Well, you know, I wasn't there, so I, I, I don't like any of let me, uh, we, we're yeah, we're to the group, you know, uh, along this way. So you're, you're saying you're probably going to set the seat. No, yeah, no, no. I, I, know, I tell them all, yeah. this is actually becomes 365. This map doesn't have okay. the detail. Thanks. Uh, we got the tour. And camp in here. And go through the car, head, cross into it, okay. and then connect. Actually, this needs to have like, some detail too, because I think I take another road. But anyway, I connect with 11, take 11 to two, uh, 178. Oh, no, take 11 to 276. Uh, on the other hand, if I was going right to Shining Rock, Shining Rock is right here. I take the 178 route. Shining Rock. Okay. Uh, so you me. And this, this will be, if you want to go there, the Fish Dog Ranger District and hike the trails there. Asheville's right over there. Okay, let me ask you this, and you right here, just uh, 178. Yeah. Just 178. Uh -huh. That goes up into what's called Rise and the Yeah. Right here. Okay, if you go over to the little pile of 276, you'll go by what's called Caesar's Head State Park. Yeah. That's the place. I, I don't know the park though. Okay. I don't right. remember. Now, right here, at the intersection of 178 and Highway 11, just five miles past it, it's called Table Rock State. I'll be done. Now, have you ever known? No, no, no. I, I, I can tell you, not, not only do, uh, it's not a matter of memory. I've never been there. I've never been there. I've never been there. Never been there. This, I would always be in transit, and the way I walk the dog when I'm in transit like that, unless I see a convenient municipal park, is I think I have a shopping center that's on a corner, you know, that's a quarter mile long, the strip shopping center, and this, you, you walk behind it. I've always said, hey, if you're going to be a burglar, get a dog. Police car comes prowling around the back of the shopping center, and you're, over, you're out there alone in the back. Well, if you got a dog, you don't think twice. <laughs> I have spent more time behind shopping centers. <laughs> and, and, and you do the whole perimeter. You do all the way around behind and then around to the main drive or zero in the corner. And then around through that. You, you can do it with I'll tell you one more time. This is, young, <laughs> this is a young man in color. Yeah. And this is a young man in color. No, it, it, this, he has such a, a face that I've seen a movie. Yeah, I've never seen it. But. He's got such a generic, you know, like, yucky color. He, color. he went out that day. Yeah. Sir, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have a snake in. I have a snake You're used to dealing with people that are the most tedious individuals in the world. And I'm going to tell you, if I won't, if I won't tell you something, I'll tell you I won't tell you. But, but I'm not going to lie. Well, you ask me about something about some. Crimes that haven't been adjudicated, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I won't answer. I'll tell you I won't answer. But listen, I'm not going to deceive you and misdirect you. On oh, yeah, let me tell you that I'm here on behalf, I'm not here for any type of charge. Oh, I have that. I'm here on I know that. Of I, and that's another reason I, I, I understand what you're going through, because you're, you're like Cable, they said, you're not 
getting all emotional about it, but you are. You are connected with these families. You know, senior GBI agent John Cato had all connected with Emerson's, my victim's family, and he's, yeah, he got it. You're going through the same thing. Well, I've had this boy's family is there from Pennsylvania, and, and to be honest yeah. with you, once a year, every year, Easter, she is here to play flowers, and she has the unknown, and, it, you know, that bothers her. And it bothers you, and I understand that. I understand why you're, that's one of the reasons you're here, is that it bothers you. They all bother you in, in a lot of ways, and especially if, it, it's, it, it gnaws at you, just like the table says, it gnaws at you, and, uh, he's, this is the word and I, I, I know that you came here hoping that there's some way, even in line, that I'll tell you something. No, sir, I want you to lie to me. No, but he, even if you could detect that I was lying, at least you would know that, but I'm going to tell you. Well, you know what, this, if you put your bags yeah. on, yeah. you you really aware. And this is what I'm seeing here. After 10 years of waiting for news about her son disappearing, she goes into the toilet, says she does not get her hopes up every time she hears of the possibility in the case. And it's our job to. Ms. Booger, this is Gary Hilton speaking. Gary Michael Hilton. And the detectives are here. Uh, Dewey and Dan are here about your son. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you've been hearing all of this, but I want to speak to you directly. And I want to assure you, uh, number one, I'm sorry for your loss. And I've seen victims' uh, families crying in court, my victims' families crying in court. I know what you're missing. I know what you would be missing if you knew your son was gone. And so I know what you're going through not knowing what happened to him or where he is. And I want to assure you, ma'am, that if I knew anything about your son, I would, I would I would refuse to answer. I'm going to, I'm, I, I want to assure you that there is absolutely no light that I can shed on the matter of your son. And I, I say that realizing that it, it certainly fits in with, with the modus operandi that I'm assumed to have used in several crimes that I'm suspected of. But it is, in this case, coincidence. And ma'am, you always got to leave room for coincidence. And that's what it is in this case. And so I'm sorry that that I can't bring you any closure ultimately, but I'm I am glad, and I hope you believe me, that this is one avenue that you can close and go on to any further avenues you may have in the future. The officers are here just out of concern for you and the victim, and uh, I can assure you that. That, that is, they're getting the true story and, and that, that I'm more than happy to cooperate. I hope you'll let them know that. I'll, I'll, I'll certainly do that. Play that for me. Well, I will. And I, I feel like that helps me hard, and I certainly hope and pray that it does. Get me. Uh, it does. It does. Uh, it does. Uh, as I tell you before, it's, uh, he's, he's not going like that. Jason's not here to speak, or he, he can't tell us where he's at. But somebody can and somebody will someday. And yes. We yes. watch and we see things like happening in North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And, you know, we're in that little triangle. And I'm sure this lady, to this day, will see a, a, a man walking down the street 100 yards from her and think, is that, is that Jason? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, she doesn't know. So, therefore, her mind just runs through every kind of possibility, including that he's still alive, that he has amnesia, that whatever. And I'm so I'm sure to this day she'll see some man with his bill. And like I say, I apologize for calling him a generic yeah, okay. A college, Joe College, okay. And, uh, but I'm sure that she'll see someone and, and perhaps she can start going towards him and following them. She may even catch a glitch of a head in a car going past her in traffic and, and turn around and follow it. I understand that. And, and I'm going to assure you, I'm going to tell you, and I'll be glad. I understand. I understand. It's your job to keep going and keep going. And I'll be glad to tell you as many times as you want. But you can close this avenue of approach. You really could. And just like with Florida, I have never admitted anything to Florida, but I've told Florida if they'll give me a deal, I'll give them full, complete cooperation. 
with anything I can. I'd more than likely say the same thing to you if, if I would say, well, I can't talk about it, but I've got to buy, can't give me another day longer. If you want to give me an entity, I'll be glad to clear it up and be happy to do so. If you had anything to do with it whatsoever, I'd appreciate it. If you told me, and you would tell me the truth. Yeah. And uh, anything to do with any charges or anything here, yeah. out of my control, I'd tell you that. I, again, I, I've got a grieving family. Well, let me go a little further. I'm trying to be, you know, a, yeah. a, a walk a fine line here. I understand. But, but I'm suspected of two murders in uh, North Carolina and one in Florida. So let me go a little further and tell you, there's nothing, no more, nothing else outside of the... I'm not telling you that I did drugs. But what I am telling you is, I'm not telling you that I didn't do it. Okay? I'm not saying I didn't do it. But what I'm saying is, whether I did or didn't, there's nothing outside of those three murders. And I'm nothing. Here. Nothing. You're not here to bust my chops. No. You're, you're not, I'm not here to take you seven. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but if I didn't want to help you, I wouldn't have talked to you at all. I was done the typical criminal's routine. Hey, I was a paratrooper. I got the POW training, you know, many like these sort of this number, you know. Don't answer. If they ask you, what are you left-handed or right-handed? What high school did you go to? Don't answer. That's one question leads to another. Believe me, I would have stonewalled you dead early. I was going to resist you. Let me ask you a question while I go, but I think that I don't know what was on the bottom I think I was writing something. You said there was nothing else. 2007 or something. Or is that what you said? About what? There was nothing prior. Oh, no, it was 1995. Okay, here's the thing. I did a local. Uh, yeah, I got that right. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, you got it. But I'll tell you, that's my, you know, in a nutshell, that's between 73 and, and, and 2004. I did unlawful telephone solicitation, unlawful charities, fraudulent telephone solicitation. I was a, I was a minor con man. That's all cleared up. I pledged to that. They gave me five years. They gave me a no-time deal. I was glad to have it. I had a grand jury indictment, 23 counts, 19 victims, 25 grand bond. I got a no-time deal. I was glad to get it. I had a theft charge resulting from an employment situation. I took they gave me material to sell a fixed material. I pled that and got a concurrent five-year probation, restitution in both cases, of course. I was delighted to get it. I had a dog, Golden Retriever, that's about six years old, that no one ever loved their child any more than I loved this dog. Huh? Yeah, okay. Nobody ever loved their child more than I loved this dog. And I knew that if I didn't want to be taken away from that dog, just like your child, you wouldn't do anything that would endanger your child's future by endangering your future. You, you're, you're determined to keep yourself out of institutionalized Okay. So I knew I had five years of probation to do, and I knew I was going to have to do it, or they just yanked me right out. And for several other reasons, I, I don't want to go straight. I really did. Okay, I, I went off, I went crazy in September, but that's another story. But anyway, I had five years to do, did it all, got on probation in 2000, and continued to go on and, and live a clean life. And uh, September, I can, I can tell you the reasons immediately leading up to it, in September, I slipped into insane behavior. And the really, the, the reasons are, I, I have a natural sociopathic character, and, and that I always have ever since I can remember. I didn't belong, I didn't fit in, I had a sense of knowing problem. I had a high level of what's called existential anxiety. That's knowing you're going to die someday. It's what drives us all. Knowing that we're going to die someday drives you to, to fill your life with something to give it meaning just to escape the knowledge that you're going to die. So therefore, you're running as hard as you can from that knowledge. We all do it. We all do it. We, we find that escape in our jobs, our family, and our church, but in a nutshell. Okay? So, I had that. I received savage training as a paraphrase. You know, where you're taught to 
this, the, this kind of training that paratroopers, that means you can fire into buildings, kill women and children, and call it suppressing enemy fire. In Iraq today, we'll destroy entire families that are driving towards soldiers that won't stop. We call it threat elimination. It's just you're trained to dissociate the act of killing from the moral constraints that you can have control. It's the impossible. Oh, we're going to open the door. You know, the door. You talk to uh, the social the act of killing from the moral constraints of society is imposed on you. I had those two things. And they were always there and they were waiting for a trigger. And the triggers were twofold. Threefold, really. One, and probably most important. Sure. Uh, one, and probably most important, I had multiple strokes that turned out. I had it for 17 years in mild form, and it went into a severe form called secondary progressive disease. I look good now, and I act good now, because I lay my back 20 hours a day. It's about two of them, but having the question now. Anyway, multiple sclerosis attacks your brain, spinal cord, nervous system, acting in the body. It can, it, it can cause lesions on the brain. It's, it's right here in front of me. Put it right here in front of me. It can cause lesions on the brain. And even though it's got six major symptoms listed, I've encountered about 40 symptoms. They're bizarre, bizarre. They're in all shapes and forms. They're in all shades and degrees. I won't get into it, but except to say that just 20 years ago, the average lifespan after our first onset of multiple sclerosis was 25 years. In the last 20 years, it's been raised 10 to 15 more years to 35 to 40. The point I'm trying to make is there's no way in which multiple sclerosis kills you. There's no way it kills you. It doesn't paralyze your breathing. It doesn't, it's not a tumor. It doesn't kill you, but yet it shortens your lifespan. And you know why it shortens your lifespan? Because of suicide. Because, because, because of suicide. That's why. Yeah, in other words, it makes you feel so, it doesn't kill you, but it makes you feel so bad that you wish you were dead. And it's because of suicide, there's a definite short in the lifespan, than, and it was just 25 years, just 20 years ago. They raised it 10 to 15 years, I believe, for one major reason, a new class of antidepressants that have come out, like Effexor and Wellbutrin, that work on the serotonin levels and the, the brain chemistry. They, I, I'm being given those now, and I've been on them for two years. They work wonders. They work wonders. That's why multiple sclerosis is so debilitating, because it produces depression as a symptom rather than an effect of the disease. In other words, you're not depressed because you're sick. You're depressed because you're sick. In other words, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm sick, and now, so I feel bad. It's like I'm sick, and, and I feel bad. It's a, a symptom, just like pain. And that's why people become so bedridden in multiple sclerosis, because of depression, the, the, the weird symptoms that can be strong or not. Or, you know you're strong now. I'm, I've been laying on my back for, for four months, and that's what I needed to do, but I couldn't do it all the outside. You see, not, not, yeah, the dog kept me hiking. In other words, I was taking high doses of Ritalin, 80 milligrams a day, very high dose. And that would give me three or four good hours a day of activity. And I could either use that to run my dog or to work. And I just, in the end, chose to run my dog. What, what good is working if you can't run your dog anywhere? So that brings us into this. So I was a goner. I was getting to the point where, and plus, most sclerosis deranges your mind. It deranges your thinking. You can't choose the right word. You can't walk from one, one room into the other and remember what you went in there for. If you can imagine doing that over and over and over throughout the day of going from one room to the other and not remembering what you were in there for, so that you stand there for a while and you look around hoping that it will come to you. Why did I come in here? If you can imagine that going over and over, you, you get to the point where you want to carry a pad in your hand and if you got to go get some scissors from the other room, you write sizzles. It's insane. The way you can't remember, you can put something down. Two minutes later, you can't remember where it was. So you say, well, the way to do that is to have a place for everything and everything in its place. 
but it never fails. You have a scissors in your hand and the phone will ring. You're just on your way to the phone. You lay the scissors down. You talk on the phone for a minute. And then you're looking for 20 minutes, literally, for the scissors. And the scissors are right there, hiding in plain sight behind a box of Kleenex. Your whole day is filled with this. So I was just becoming disordered. I was physically debilitated again. I lay flat on my back for at least 20 hours a day, and I'm happy to do it, okay? And so... And what did you say your first symptoms came on? My first symptoms were in 1984, but I had a type called relapsing remitting, which is one or two attacks every one to three years. Typically, the attacks last for weeks or months, but in my case, they only lasted for a week. So about once or so a year, I got knocked flat down, wham, unmistakable set of wham, laid right out for a week. I thought it was chronic mononucleosis of some kind, recurring mononucleosis, because that was the symptom. Well, I thought it was chronic fatigue sy syndrome. Did you ever, after one of, the, after one of your attacks, did you ever, uh, somebody come say you did a crime, you did something? Oh, no, I was conscious. I was, I, I would sleep 27 hours straight. Oh, I, uh, other investigators had covered that, uh, too. I, I have never slept walk or or being in, in that kind of, of, of thing, of, of leaving and coming back. Never. So we got a okay, but anyway, anyway, in, in 2001, I entered a stage called secondary progressive. Now, when people come down with MS, 85% of them start out with relapsing and remitting. Of those 85%, about 50% go on to something called secondary progressive. Secondary progressive, bad news. It's continuous deterioration marked in some cases by periods of remission, okay? Well, I was very lucky. I had some very significant periods of remission. But I finally saw medical help, got a diagnosis, and started a very effective treatment program consisting of injections and daily injections, uh, antidepressants, Ritalin, okay? <coughs> but the doc, Starting out with 20 milligrams of, uh, of Ritalin a day. I'm a drug abuser, and, and it's well known in Ritalin. Not a drug abuser, I'm a pothead. And uh, I've abused drugs. And I'm not, anyway. And, it's, and the warnings are in Ritalin that, uh, that people that have abused drugs are likely to unnecessarily increase their dosage, which is exactly what I did. I kept high up and 10 milligrams a day. I got up to 80 milligrams. That's a very high dose. Now I was getting very aggressive, very just, you know, coming right at you, you know what I mean? Not mean, but just tell it like the fuck it is. Shut the fuck up, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so the triggers are all there. My mind's disordered, I'm sociopathic, I've been taught to be a stone cold killer. Hey, paratroopers are bad motherfuckers, man. They kill you stone cold. I mean, we have companies that nicknames to be Cold Steel Cobra, you know, that kind of shit, you know what I mean? We had a bunch of sociopaths back in the 60s. We loved it, you know. We called it airborne class. Our idea of a good joke, you'd be sitting around watching TV with a bunch of straight people and the news would be on and someone would come on saying, oh, and I lost my daughter and she was killed and then, and everything. And you go, ha, 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 Oh, we thought that kind of shit was funny as hell. Just sociopathic behavior. We loved it, okay. Anyway. So I had those th the, the things in place, and here comes the triggers, the, the MS, deranging my mind, making me hopeless. Can't make any more money. I'm really going up against it. I'm ready to commit suicide. And I was determined that if finally I couldn't make a living rather than trying to go on some kind of welfare that I wouldn't be happy with, I'd kill myself. And I, I, I told people that over and over. And I guess the reason I didn't is because of my dog. In order to kill myself, I would have had to kill him first or go give him away to somebody. And either one, I couldn't bring. At any given day, I couldn't get up and kill that dog or go give him to somebody and walk away from him. I couldn't do it. So that just kept me alive. And then the final thing, I found out John Tabor, the guy I worked for for 10 years, I trusted the man so much that I did some very stupid things, and that is I didn't take care of my money. And I found that actually the man, this is not any paranoid delusions, this is true, 
I found out he had been stealing approximately half of my pay for 10 years. Yeah, a total of over 150 grand. The guy never gave me one single delayed go back sale, even though in his sales I would see that, you know, leads he got for himself in Iran, I would see that fully 50% of his sales were go back. They want one call closes. You know what I mean? And one might say, well, Gary, it took you 10 years to, to, to realize that you hadn't been paid on one single go back? Damn, what kind of dumb shit are you? Well, all I can say is, Sometimes it makes some bad choices in people we trust. We all do. They pick the ba a wrong wife or the wrong husband. That happens a lot, don't it? Yeah, that, hu that husband telling them, oh, honey, I love you and I'm working late. She hired a private detective and he's out here screwing some woman, coming home to her every night for 10 years after he's been with some other woman and, you know, breaking his vows and just lying like a psychopath. You go back, you go low, you went ahead to that woman. In 1998, you, you really didn't have this, uh, uh, No, 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 I was secondary, I was, uh, relapsing and uh... Now you knew what you did in 98. Oh, yeah, 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 I was, I was stood. I was, uh, almost, almost at the height of my powers. Actually, I, I really reached the apogee in about 94, 95, 96. But I, I could hike. Uh, and so forth, and get around and work uh, as well or better as I've ever been able to do. So I was well with it. I can assure you, officer, let me tell you, uh, even though I can't give you a, 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 an alibi for people, because I was living in my truck, literally, okay? I was sleeping in, in an office park where I worked a lot of nights. I just barely missed that tornado, I was just barely missed being outside. I was up at Powers Ferry and Ruby Hill Road, and that's where the track of that tornado first touched down and went across Dunwoody and tore the living hell out of that place. And I would have been right in the woods if I hadn't at the last moment decided to go somewhere else. So that's why I remember that. Well, that's, you've had no problems talking around uh, North Carolina. Is that what you do being in North Carolina, Georgia? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, and I'm from South Carolina. Uh, I know you. one day you're going to get you, you're just going to lift a big burden off your heart, and you're going to let everybody know what's right. Oh, I, I, I wish I could now, but not if they won't kill me. No, the court is trying to extradite me to kill me right now. Yeah, I'm, I've already offered to, to lift it all. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, in the same sense, if you had anything to do with anything on that country kid in 1998, you would tell me, right? And you oh, I would know. tell you that I'm not going to tell you and ask for a deal. I would tell you, I can't talk about it, but if you'll give me immunity, I'll tell you everything I can tell you. I told the Lord of that. But you never told me that about the kid, though. But you're saying you don't know anything about it. Except that I've, I've seen it in the paper over and over and over again. What I know about it is that he went hiking there and they found his car and they never, and it's a dead end after that. And I thought, damn, that, that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> you know, that, that's, you know, that's really you know what I mean? In Florida, if they hadn't, a, a, if they hadn't been hunting season and a hunter hadn't found her body, then it might have decayed to the point where it would have never been found. Okay. If, if I had got, if I hadn't have given him the girl's body here in Georgia, I gave him, gave him that body. If I hadn't have given him that body, it would have been the same. And, they, and I hadn't been seen with her. It's just a change. In other words, if I had to carry out the, the crime the way I planned it, if I had executed it the way I planned it, and it had gone right. It would have been the same thing. They would have found her car in the parking lot of Blood Mountain, and she would have vanished. Her dog would have been gone too. I, I let, me ask, let me ask you a question. Let's just say for one second, uh -huh. one minute. Now, what I'm telling you right now is that more or less or not exactly a lie, but there's no truth to it whatsoever. That if, if I were able to tell you right now, at this very moment, you knew something about the uh, missing child that's missing from uh, Clemson University. Yeah. And I will tell you that 
You're not getting the death penalty. You're not getting yeah. no more time. Here's the answer to that. Here would be the answer. I would say, I'll be glad to help you. Let's get an attorney in here and make it real. It won't be real unless an attorney's here to witness it. Let's get an attorney here and make it real. I'll go for it. In other words, you know, I'm not in an interrogation. It's, someone gives me a deal. I, I got it. was not real unless I have representation. And, and I would tell you, know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking You know, and I understand that police officers are permitted to lie in an interrogation. They are permitted to tell you anything. Yeah, I mean, I understand it. That's why, that is why I would say, let's get an attorney here and make it real. Let me ask you. I would tell you, yes, it's a deal. I'll shake on it. I promise you, I will, I'll go for it. Would if you would tell me right now, immunity or, or life sentence for, for spilling on this, I'd say, yeah. Why not? Why not? You know? After the plea that you made to the mama, and the yeah. truth is just told us, Told him, uh, yeah. He told her, would there be a reason for me to go find you a lawyer and come back? No, I, uh, that's the sad part of it. Uh, that's the sad part of it. Uh, and I feel bad because I understand that this is, until this moment, I hope, and it's no longer a hope, until this moment, this is all, this what has been, me, has been a hope that you have and she has that I could clear this up. That in in your mind, if there's been an unresolved avenue, and what oh, in your mind there's been an unresolved, there's a hope that if you could get to me and talk to me, I would either indicate that I could help you, or you could tell that I was lying and therefore dissembling over something, concealing something within itself. A lie will tell you something as much as the truth will. And so I know this has been a hope for you and the family. Well, well, I don't you get in the court where you tell me something I wanted to hear. Oh! To, you know, I, I, I think you're... I'm not playing with you. I'm playing with you in that, hey, I'm glad for the company. Listen, I'm sitting at a 6 by 8, 24-7, laying on my back. There's no problem. I watch TV. I got my own TV. I read. I got my meals cooked. Sir, Timmy, the dishes are washed, my laundry's done. Hey, I love it. And that's why I say, I already got life. If you could give me a, a life, a plea on this, you know, I'd be happy. But what I don't, what I'm dreading, the big thing in my life, is what is trying to take me and kill me. You see, if they, if they just leave me alone and let me stay here, they could have it the easy way. They could save themselves $2 million. They could get the full story right now. They could save the family a lot of agony and grief of uh, sitting in this trial uh, and so forth. And they'd also, because they're never going to get the story out of me if they try me. I'll go to my death just because I told Florida, I'll give you everything if you'll do it the easy way, but if you won't, I'll fight you all the way. I'm fighting my extradition right now. I know I'll be extra out and of course, I'm the person they're seeking, they got a warrant. I know I'll go, <coughs> but like I took the warden here, <coughs> excuse me, if I can delay this three days, that's potentially three days longer I ever live, so. You would want to get your heart right with everything that you've done. I, it's, I, I just as soon do it. I, I, I just as soon do it. I, on the one hand, I have a societal view, and you know, there's a lot of tragedy in this world. We got 35,000 people killed in car wrecks every year. This is just one more death. Hey, no big thing. But on the other hand, I've got remorse for what I did. Okay. In a strange way. You know, I know I have a flat at that. I don't know it like that. But you know, some, I look and it disturbed, let me put it this way. It disturbed me when I did it, and it, and it disturbs me now. And I know what grief is. And it's strange to say I never loved anything but a dog. But God, when my dog Ranger died in 2000 and, uh, 2001, it, it killed me. It did kill me. It killed me. Anybody ever hurt your dog? No. I mean, I, that's why I'm always fighting. What kind of was? Golden Retrievers. I always run Golden Retrievers. I had him for 11. I had my current dog for line uh, five. Uh, the great blessing or benefit out of this case is that I found a wonderful home for my dog. 
And this particular dog was not a typical golden in that he was never eager to please me. He never particularly liked me. He had a lot of dominance, aggression. He always wanted to be the boss. He's, he was five years old. He was five years old. It took me years to get that dog right. I'm telling you, I, he was like Cool Hand Luke in that movie. Cool Hand Luke. And cool Hand kept running and, you know, they'd say, Luke, you better get your mind right. The man with no eyes says, you run again, he's going to kill you. They had him digging six by sixes. They had him in the sweater. Everything else, that dog wouldn't get his mind. Anyway, the point is that an investigator, a woman for the uh, Dawson Public Defender's Office, uh, had a real need in her heart for a dog. She had lost a dog after seven years, so torn up, had to take two days off from work, et cetera, et cetera. And to make a long story short, that dog sleeps with her. And that dog wouldn't sleep in the same room with me. Okay, that dog will spoon. She says, he spoons up next to me. And I, I said, damn, that, my mind's at rest over that. Here, let me say this to you. Man. I'm here because the person's been missing for 10 years. I told you that. Yeah. I told you I'm here because of a grieving family. I've been grieving for 10 years. And I hope to the good Lord someday that you come to peace with all the officers and all the courts and everything else and so that you really don't leave those other people's family yeah grieving for yeah. 10 years yeah. and I really that's, that's up to them right. though that's up to them but that's up to them because if they're going to try to kill me of course I ain't going to give up nothing what would you do if someone is you already got lied and now they want to kill you what would you do you'd be pissed off You'd fight everything. Everything was going to be a big deal. Starting from extradition to whether I got enough blankets in jail. I'm going to fucking raise hell. Total hell. I told my jury, uh, my uh, poor lawyers, I won't be happy and unless it takes three to four years to go to trial, unless we have a thousand person jury pool, and unless we have at least two changes of venue. If you, <laughs> and that's just to begin with. Okay, Brian Nichols up in Atlanta has spent a million and a half defense, two and a half million prosecution, four million. They haven't even picked a jury yet. I won't be happy unless I do that to them. And they, I am, I am. And if what they want, and if they want, I'm gonna get out of bed. <laughs> I, I got multiple sclerosis. If I say I can't get out of bed, I can't get out of bed, man. I think I'm gonna play total hell. You know why? because I got life already, I've offered to do it the easy way, to give not only the family the closure that they could never otherwise get, and to make it easy for the state, and easy for me. I've offered that, and if they want to just say, we're gonna, excuse me, and if they want to say, if they want to say, well, we're gonna do it the hard, the hard way, yeah, and, they, and so if they say, well, we're going to do it the hard way. We're going to spend $4 million and 15 years to kill you, okay, and not have this cleared up and never know what happened. They may, they may in Florida, they may be missing body parts. They may have recovered body parts. They could be missing. She was decapitated. That's well known. Well, they may be missing her head. And if they were missing their head, and if I did it, I could give them that head. And I'd be happy to do it. But if they don't want to get her head, et cetera, and they want to kill me instead, and spend four mil, et cetera, et cetera, bring it on. I'm 61 years old, I got 17 years of life expectancy. Bring it the fuck on. If you want to get me into the execution chamber when I'm almost 80 years old, if I live that long, hey, knock your fucking self out. You got a fight on your hands. Well, How do you know they want to put you there? I actually don't know that, but it's, here's my reasoning. I've offered the De Leon County detectives a deal. Now, I know they're not really made for state attorney, but I, I told them, I told them, and, and assuming that they at least take it back to them, I got live, they can't give me another day. Right? So what does that leave? What does it leave? Why are they extraditing me when I said right now, you don't even have to bother with that. I want to stay in Georgia. I like these people here. I do. I do. I like Georgia prison system. You know why? 
because within terms, within the concept of penal institutions, they understand that if a person is reasonably happy and, and, and not dissatisfied, he's less likely to assault a guard. Well, you know, you have a matter of safety. You have to get a treatment on that. You, you don't want to have to go to a prison until the last thing that you've done in your life that you need to be uh, punished for. you got to go to other prisons and I do. come back. But how, why couldn't they just come up here and, to, and take it? Now, you're a smart man. You know that they No, I don't know that. Thing. No. You know Florida can't come up here and try you for a kid. Not try me. Come up here. You can't take a plea here. You have to go no, Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. That makes me feel better. Well, who knows? You might walk in there and judge me. Oh, okay. Well, here, I... I that's good. I didn't know how you got that feeling. Oh, that's, that's why. Yeah. That's why. Now, on top of that, although... Who's to say, my Florida attorneys were up here um, uh, 10 days ago. And they said, they said that at this time, Leon County says they won't take a plea. At this time. However, that's a minor thing. Maybe just a you know, strategic maneuvering. But no, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I thought that they could come up here with this. Attorneys make it real. Wave, sign. Oh, that's good news. That's good news for me to even think that there's a glimmer of hope that I could go down there and cooperate with them and then either go in their prison system or more ideally come back here. The question where you got a problem with marijuana, simple possession of marijuana, whatever where you dealt with. You couldn't go to South Carolina plead on that case. Come to think of it. In 95, when I got the two concurrent terms of probation, I had to clear up Cobb County, and then I had to go to the Cab County and go in that jail. Come to think of it. You know? That's good. I'm glad. Now, see? You, you helped me. You helped me. Because I couldn't be. Here's the thing. I haven't been able to figure I know the state don't make sense. <laughs> this don't make sense. I know states don't do things the easy way. I know the state attorney general is a political position and so forth. And when politics comes in, common sense goes out the window. I knew all that, but I could not figure out for the fucking life of me why in the hell they going to pick themselves out such a hard road to hoe for probably nothing because I'm going to die before they can get me. I know the world is faster in Georgia, but nevertheless, if it takes them 15 years, i got at least 80% chance of dying in that time. Well, I got a life expectancy of 17.1 years right now, okay? And I could not figure out why in the hell are they that boneheaded? Are they that vicious? Are they that fucking savage? Here? You know? Remember now, I told you, you said you understood your rights. I'm yeah. Say, yeah, I'm going to tell you something else. Yeah. And, uh, you just figured out yourself, but you're already, you're, you're a ward of the state of Georgia. Yeah. If you go to Florida, you're still a ward of the state of Georgia. You, you figure that out. You belong to the state of Georgia. This is a place where you got a life of prison. You know, another roommate was telling me, that if I, that if I got I got right here and another inmate was saying this, more or less the same thing. He's been in a million prisons. His name is Michael Lang and he's been in a million. You have to do your time here in Tennessee. That's what he said. He 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 said he said. Well, listen, if you go down to Florida and plead the life, you'll have to come back to Georgia and do your sentence of life here, and then after you die here, you know, in effect, you have to go back and do the life there. That's what he told me, and th that does make, make sense, in a sense. That's good news. Listen, I'm going to tell you guys again, and I understand you can't hear it enough from me. You can't. You know why? Because you used to deal with sorry motherfuckers. <laughs> I ain't no convict. I've been built six months in, in jails, but I've never been in prison. I'm not a what. I'm so damn sociopathic that I can't even get along with criminals. I can't get along with straight people. I, I'm a... I'm a cut above for criminals and I can't fit in with straight people. They ain't my kind of people. These damn jailbirds aren't my kind of people. The reason I'm not so happy now, I'm in protective custody. I don't like to be around anyone. That's the way I like it, okay? I don't I don't have to sleep with these guys. They can't get to me, etc. So what I'm trying to say is I know you're used to dealing with guys that 
get off on spinning your wheels and just go out for the fucking hell of it. Listen, I'm not about that. I am a man of my word. Uh, your word is all a man has. It, it really is. And it, so, uh, so within the context of me saying to you right now that I'm telling you the truth, you got, I like you, you should be in movies, you're a good guy. I know you're cops, but I can see that you're good cops and that you're not pissing me off. And <laughs> detectives are not supposed to piss people off, but you are really good at what you do. And I appreciate that. Uh, I, I like a pro. And I'm, I'm going to tell you again, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you as many times as necessary, because I understand how, I can see that this is still, you're not letting it go. You're still chewing on it like a dog on a bone. You're not letting it go, but you got to let it go. you got to let it go, man. You, you let it, on this, this one right here, no, no, yeah, I'm with you. Oh, with me. You're not letting, you're still, you're still, Still, just... I wrote my name, my ass. I know. <laughs> you're still... I just, just something, just, as you know. You're still, because it's, it's, it's instinct by now, by this point in your career, it's just instinct. You're like a dog, man. You just won't give up. But with me, yes. you got to let it go. you got to let it go. I'm going to tell you, let it go. Forget about it. Sleep easy tonight, knowing go in that direction. Sleep easy tonight, and knowing that you probably have the best lead you have solved, got to the bottom of the best lead in this case that you probably have gotten. I am probably, if not the only lead, by far the best lead. I know when you saw me, you said, "That's the guy. That's the guy." This is him. This is him. And not only that, I understand another thing. I'm too old to be a serial killer to start a killing. That's what's flipping the FBI and everyone else out. The, the damn FBI uh, behavioral, behavioral specialists dying to get at me. I've read the articles. The retired FBI uh, put Father Cliff Van's ass saying, hey, this guy didn't just fall off the turnip truck. He's been doing this. He's too old. I'm too old to be a serial killer just starting out. I break the mold completely. Nothing like this has ever happened almost before, except that couple in the 80s out west that was killing migrant laborers. It doesn't happen that way. By the time they're 61, serial killers are either burnt out, suicided out, or incarcerated. You, they just don't start killing people when they're 61. Well, son, I did. I did. And I told you why. Because there was a sociopathic character that had always been there because I've been savagely trained as a paratrooper just to kill without thinking and remorse. It's just a separate thing from society. And triggered by the fact that, that I was being debilitated, deranged by multiple sclerosis, uh, and a sense of victimization. There's your classic serial killer sense of victimization because I found that I've been wronged by society and by my employer. And in the end, in desperation and knowing I couldn't make a living, that I was going to either kill myself or somebody, I said, I'm going down hard. And you see, and I was able to do it. I was able to do it. I was able to kill someone, beat them to death. Let me tell you something. It's hard to beat someone to death. I know, no. What I mean, I don't mean most. It's hard emotionally. It's hard physically. You think you've taken an iron bar this long, it's a solid iron bar, and hit someone one time, and your skull will cave in or something like that. It don't happen that way. That fucking thing bounced right the fuck off. It's just like you hit a, a block of cement that's got a, a rubber covering over it. That's what it feels like. There's no smashing. It don't smash like an eggshell. They don't go unconscious. They start screaming. Man, you got to beat them and beat them and beat them and beat them and beat them. And finally, you got to get their skull so fractured up that then it starts to smash. You get blood splattering up in your face. It'll, you get a mist of blood splattering into your eyes. It just puts a red film over everything. It's fucking tough as hell, OK? And I was able to do it because of the training I had received as a paratrooper. You throw that hand grenade and you come around. I, I, I was certified as a bayonet expert. It, 
you the first time you ever go to a bayonet. I mean, orders were cut. As the first time you go to a bayonet range, the instructor will say, gentlemen, there's two, on the battlefield, there are two kinds of bayonet fighters, the good ones and the dead ones. And then he'll say, what's the spirit of the bayonet? And you go, top kill, okay? Listen, <laughs> I went through years of this shit. And so when you kill it like that, when you have that kind of training, it's horrifying, it's disgusting, it's stomach turning, but you just put yourself on autopilot, it's got to be done, okay? I don't even know why I heard it on this. Well, tell you the truth, do. I'm just saying that, uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. you, can, you, can, you, can, you can cross it, you can go home and sleep. You'll be both sad and you're happy. You're, you're going to be sad and that now you're back to nothing. But we worked hard to prove that you didn't do it. I know, I know, because you want the truth rather than, than any other thing. You're not there to check off, well, there's another one done, okay? So I understand you're back to nothing now. You're, you're back to just nothing, just like they were up in North Carolina. FBI came and, and Transylvania County Sheriff came and talked to me uh, from North Carolina, and they said, you know, we just had nothing. We had nothing. We were just, you know, nothing. And then so this came know. to light, and that woman, Emerson, my victim, she she gave us that opportunity, and she did. She called me. She called me. Okay. They know that I did it up in North Carolina. They know that I did it in Florida. Okay. Okay. It's already cleared up in their mind, regardless of what happens. Okay. And you have you have nothing, but. That's the bad part, but it's good and bad. You got nothing. Well, you, you got nothing still. When you say that you talk about North Carolina, mm -hmm. I do. I kept up with that because whenever I first heard that she was missing, you know, within a week or so later, I yeah. saw you, and then you could see all my notes went right straight back to the day that you were arrested, the day she she was missing. But my heart went out to the family in North Carolina. There was one boy, I think, and he had he came all the way from Texas when everybody kind of was, just stopped the search. And he went, and that, that boy was real strong. I don't know the man, I didn't Never met him. parents. Oh, I, I know where I was headed. I know how they feel because I've been working with this lady. Okay, let me conclude the point I was trying to make when I lost my thread of thought when I got into that thing of killing people. I mean, just to finish that thought, the, the GBI asked me, what does it feel to cut someone's head off? And I, and I told him it's, it's just surreal. It's like it wasn't real. And that's the way it is. I, I'm a human. I'm a, believe it or not, I'm, I'm more sensitive than you. You're a tough individual. I can tell that. You're a tough. You're tougher than I am. And so it, in order to cut someone's head off, you have to go back to your military training and just do it. Just fucking don't think about it. Do it. But here's the point I was trying to make, and it's the, probably the most important thing that's gnawing on you in the end, and that is, I'm not, I'm too old to be a serial killer. I'm too old just to start killing people. It don't happen, but this is the point I'm making. It happens. I told you why. Oh, I told you, sociopathic character, savage training as a paratrooper, then now, mobile sclerosis has got no, no hopes, dreams, plans, or schemes. No way I can work my way out of it, no nothing. I'm gonna go down, right? And then my damn one person I trusted in the world been stealing from me and lying to me just like a bad spouse for 10 years. You know how that bad spouse, so oh, honey, I love you. Oh, honey, you know, that kind of shit. He's over there fucking some other body else. He's got cum smeared all over him and everything else when he comes home at night. Oh, honey, I love you. And you know the hurt that, that and so it, those, the sociopathic character, the savage training, were triggered by the multiple sclerosis getting real bad. And then my 25th year, my seventh, my seventh year of secondary progressive, getting really bad. Depression, really bad pain, every kind of weird symptom in the world. And then finding out uh, this son of a bitch had looked at me and say, yeah, we're on the same team and have been stealing my shit. I said, okay, this is the fucking end. I'm gonna go down hard, you know. And in retrospect, I, I had the, the greatest regret that I didn't start robbing banks instead. I mean, instead of choosing to kill people. 
for a few stinking hundred dollars. That's stupid. And I don't even enjoy killing that much. It was just a, a sociopathic rage against society in general that I was able to kill a human being and not view them as an individual, but, but view it in a societal context and that, like, like I, I talked about that boy, I said, he's just another one of those great idiots in college. He's an individual, he's a beloved son, he's talented, he's, he's a great guy. I viewed him in a societal context, yeah, another grinning fucking idiot with this loose dog running around out of control and not able to figure out for the life of him why in the world I should have object of him letting his big dog pile on my dog. Dumb shit. He's a fucking idiot, you know. It's a societal context. It's, you know. Let me ask you something. You keep going back to the military. I, I saw an infantry, but I, I gotta ask you, what, what do you do here military training? Oh, the training? Yeah. Okay. I was at Fort Gordon for basic and infantry training. Well, I heard all that info. That's what I was Yeah, uh, they was the basic training, and then they was your AIT, which was infantry. Then I went to good old Benning, uh, 1964, jump school, July. Jump school in July. Oh, my God. When the temperature got up to 96 degrees, they'd run a red flag up the flagpole and we wouldn't have to run everywhere. <laughs> okay, that was the break you got. Okay. Okay, I, uh, I'm gonna go back and I'll have a line. I want you to go back and tonight I want you to feel good. Yeah. And bad. Leo. No, I get it for you. I want you to feel good and, and to feel bad. You have just shot down. Uh, I hope, I, I hope, pray that you get your life straightened out and bring closure to all the families of everybody. Oh, you and me all and I think you 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 you'll be following this and you're going to hear, trust me. You I'm going to hear that. I want it to happen. I want to give it to you. But I'm not going to let him kill me for what you're doing. You just what you're doing. Okay. Right, because me you, just, you just remember the things that we told you. To, and I'm gonna, and I want you to remember again, though, for the 10th time, you done, you done closed out your best lead. You're only the, you done, you, it's, you done closed it. You can put it out of your mind. That's good news, it's bad news. Well, it's bad news. We'll just keep digging, it. Now. We'll keep searching. Well, at least you can go on and do something productive. And if anything, I swear to God. If there's any way you can help me or some of your thoughts or whatever, that would I'm, be great. I'm, you're I'm still not letting it go. <laughs> you know, I'm still can't. not letting it go. You know, Forget I can't. about it. <laughs> it ain't there. Forget it. All right. Don't even. you still not letting it go. Forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Okay. Forget, about it. Right. Forget about it. It ain't there. It didn't happen. I promise you. I, I swear I promise you. I, I believe you. I'm looking in your eyes. I haven't said it, but it ever came out that I did, God hey, I'd be sorry. So like, listen, it, it ain't there. It's well, not there. You're it's free, not there. You're no, free to talk in a circle about it, but you never put my person in a circle, and so I believe you. No way. I've already told you what I did. You know what I did. I've told you in as many words exactly what I did. Okay. okay. And that's all I did. All right. Okay. Well, and the thing is, I, I, and I didn't, I didn't start killing the last 61, and that's the way it is. It's not supposed to happen that way, but it did. And now you know the reason why. Okay. One, one, one final thing that we, as we leave, uh, you know, this is a big man, right? We never, we never bothered you, hurt you, or promised you Absolutely anything. Absolutely not. I've enjoyed talking to you, and I've been more than happy. And, I, and if there is any more questions, I'll be able to ask you. And, uh, and again, to the family, you can, you can put this out of your mind totally. These officers have done their job. They, they have, they are a part of us. They're, yeah, that's probably the warden or something. Yeah, these, right. these officers have come down, and, and you can rest assured, the family of the victim, that this case is in the best hands of the two guys that it could ever be. It's just this particular avenue is done. It's done. It's over with. All right, okay. Mr. Hilton, I appreciate okay. it. Okay, it's done. Well, thank you. Oh, this concludes okay. the interview. All right.